Hi there, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. You're probably expecting Celeste and I have to disappoint you. She is on a well-earned vacation, so I am filling in for her tonight for our Taste of Art with Lost Rhino Brewing Company presented by Chase. We'll just give a couple of minutes to let everyone get in, get settled, get those beers ready if you have them. Okay, I think that's a good place to start. So welcome everybody. My name is Izzy Fuqua. I'm the adult programs coordinator for the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, filling in for Celeste Feta, who typically hosts this program, VMFA Fridays After Five, presented by Chase. Uh, and this program in particular is called Taste of Art, and we are featuring Lost Rhino Brewing Company from Ashburn, Virginia. And we have a whole crew from Lost Rhino, Stephanie Richards, manager of events, Russ Sabag, seller manager, and a special guest, Logan Martin, the in-house graphic designer. So we are going to have a great talk tonight. Um, for those of you who have never joined a program, a Taste of Art program before, um, just going to go over a few housekeeping notes. If you're pairing the beer, uh, maybe you picked it up with uh, VMFA Amuse to Go or you got it from your local bottle shop. Um, we recommend that you pour that beer into a clear glass just as it's int introduced. So we will take each beer um, uh, singularly and we'll pair work of art after we talk about it. Um, this, is, uh, this program is hosted via Zoom webinar, which means uh, we can see each other, uh, meaning the speakers, but we can't see you, our audience. So if you have a question or a comment, please use the chat function, which is found at the bottom of your screen. You just bring your mouse down if you're not seeing any Zoom functions. Um, click chat, a window will pop up, and you can either send things to just us, the panelists, if you wanna share something, or if you'd like for everyone to hear it or read it, um, you can type that in and press send. That's where we'll be taking a lot of the questions as well. So please use the chat as opposed to the Q&A. Okay, so like I said, three works of art, three beers. Um, we have a lot to get through. So I'm going to turn it over to our special guests at Lost Rhino. Um, Stephanie, Logan, and Russ, can you just tell us a little bit about Lost Rhino? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I will start off by saying that the slide that you see here is Matt Hagerman. He's our CEO and founder. And um, we actually just celebrated last weekend our 10 year birthday or anniversary. So we have been in business in Loudoun County for 10 years. Um, and the way that we got our start, there was an original brewery of Loudoun County, of Loudoun County, Old Dominion Brewery, and um, Matt, our, our wonderful founder and CEO, he worked at Old Dominion and, um, and kind of started off as working as a brewer and learned about the trade and the industry and decided that he really wanted to do this on, on his own, started his own brewery. So, um, Old Dominion happened to be acquired and moved out of the area. He took that opportunity to scrape together anything he could to buy whatever equipment they would sell him. And that is actually some of the equipment that we still use here today. So I'm going to turn that over to our seller manager to talk a little bit more about what goes on in the operation. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so we still use the original Old Dominion brew house. It is a four vessel, uh, 25 barrel capacity brew house. Um, and so you can see it right there. That's the, the back side of it where you see our boil kettle to your left and our whirlpool to your right. So just very basic overview of the brewing process. You have your mash tun where you're, you mash in with basically you're, you're making a cereal, a hot oatmeal cereal with your grains, your barleys and any specialty. Um, adjuncts that will differentiate different beers, add color, add more biscuity or bready flavors, or add more sweetness to the beer uh, that will linger um, into the fermentation stage. Then you have your water ton, which is behind the whirlpool that you see in front of us. That's where 
you recirculate and try to clear up and get a lot of those finer pro uh, particulates of the grain out of there um, and transfer that over into your boil kettle. The majority of our beers are, uh, especially one that you're going to have today, um, our New River beer get boiled for 90 minutes, which is not very common um, in the brewing industry these days. Most beers are boiled for 60 minutes. That 90 minute boil really enhances a lot of the flavors. It creates, um, for anybody who is uh, a culinarist on the side, creates those maillard reactions um, to really darken the beer and caramelize the beer and give some more complexity to your malt. Bill. Um, one of the few, one of the things that we also have here that a lot of breweries don't have is a hop back. So we use whole cone hops to create a, a richer, more pugnant hop flavor that you will experience when we get to that part of the tasting. And um, so that that's the brew house that you're looking at. Behind us, we have uh, a majority of our cellar. We have one of our bigger tanks um, that usually houses face plant. It's a hundred barrel vessel. The rest of our vessels are 50 barrel vessels. So it does take a bit of time to fill our 100 barrel vessel with a 25 barrel brewing system. Um, and we do have our own canning line here that we just finished cleaning up maybe about a couple of hours ago. We just canned our uh, summer seasonal release, which will be hitting the stores in a few weeks, Dawn Patrol, um, which is a session India pale ale. Um, again, very fresh, very um, pugnant and um, pronounced hops. Um, so yeah, that's basically our operation here. We do can everything in-house, so all the beers that you're enjoying here were made by us, canned and packaged by us, and brought straight to y'all. Oh, well, that's a nice touch there. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, the fact that it's coming from Ashburn, and we know that, is, is a, nice, a nice thing to keep in mind. And you know, you say basically that's it, but you said so many things that I'm sure <laughs> many of us have no idea. So please, I would encourage anyone who had a question, um, you know, that's what we're here for. So please um, ask questions of anything. Um, but um, I, I think we should just get started with these um, with these beers. So let's go to our first one, which is um, a flagship, right? A, one that's kind of year round called Rhino Chasers, um, a Pilsner. So I think now we're going to crack the beer and um, pour. So do you guys have any recommendations for pouring beyond using a clear glass? Um, use a clear glass. Um, Rhino Chasers, we do tend to carbonate at a higher level as is a Pilsner. So when you crack it open, you, you might foam over. That's okay. It's, okay. it's fine. <laughs> when you're pouring your beer, obviously hold your glass at a 45 degree angle and pour into the angle so you're not foaming over too much and you retain your carbonation profile, which you work very hard on for you guys. Um, and you should see a nice, clear, what we call bright beer in that experience. It should pour like a straw. Uh, uh, hay, a hay straw color, but very mm -hmm. clear. You'll be able to see your fingers through the glass. Yeah, it's like a pale, almost like a yellow gold color. Yeah, yeah great. Um, well, like I shared with uh, my co-host, I'm expecting, so I'm gonna have to take, um, take a leave on the actual tasting, but um, smelling and looking, I mean, it, it smells wonderful, kind of almost sweet and fruity a little bit. Yes. So this, this Pilsner is actually inspired by the Bohemian style Pilsners. So it has a stronger hop profile than your typical Pilsner. Um, uh, an example of a more commercially known Pilsner would, would be closer to like a Budweiser or something like that. So if we have okay. someone come into the tasting room and they're like, oh, what's closest to like a Budweiser or a Bud Light? Usually a uh, Rhino Chaser is one of the things that one of our, our beer tenders would recommend. So a nice entry point into maybe something um, that uh, someone new to craft beer could enjoy. Exactly. exactly. And it also oh, looks like something to enjoy during the summer on a, like a nice hot day. Yeah, it's a great pool beer, great out, out by the beach beer. Um, it does, we do have um, some sour malt that we put into it. So it gives it a bit of a twang and it uses uh, all noble hops. So a lot of saws hops in there. That's a traditional German hop. Um, so it really gives it a nice earthy flavor to balance with that fruitiness that you get from the yeast. Yeah. Okay, great. 
Um, well, you know, we can't get away from talking about um, what's on the, the can, but also the, the meaning of the brewery name. We have a rhino. Can we just talk about it? Why, why lost rhino and why in Ashburn, Virginia? And why does he have a surfboard? Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to let Logan take that. He's, so he's been with the team the longest. It's, okay. uh, the name lost rhino actually comes from... So Actually, what you're seeing here, rhino chasers, the, the term rhino chasers is actually a surfing term for uh, a surfer who is like constantly checking like the, the swell report. And they're like going after the big waves and stuff like that. That's a rhino chaser. Big old wave is rhino. Uh, and so rhino chasers is here. And so that's kind of how they ended up with the rhino. And like the lost part was mainly because, as you can see, a lot of our uh, themes are around like outdoors or like surfing terms and stuff like that. And we're, if anyone knows where Ashburn is, we're right next to the Dulles Airport. And we're not really near an ocean exactly, <laughs> no beach. So it's kind of like lost. And they like, oh, lost rhino, it sounds cool. And yeah. So we ended up with the rhino with the surfboard on its back and lost rhino. And had a lot of questions since then. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. So yeah. does does um Matt by chance is is he a surfer or does he have a he background? Is, he, he okay. Is a surfer. Yes. And okay. He's, uh, if you've ever if you ever get a chance to meet him when you if you ever come up to the brewery, uh, the man loves his reggae and he's always you know he's got bands on. He's got like a early shirt yeah. and stuff like that. <laughs> he's all about. <laughs> that that so, should have been our warm up music, some reggae. Yes. Yes. We contemplated having it in the background. <laughs> no, I like mean, intro. Next time. Next time. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and the can design. So I'm not going to let Logan get away without giving oh, himself a little bit of credit I mean, for the can design. Yeah. It's it was. <laughs> this is actually one of the first can designs we had, and okay. uh, it was, you know, pretty much speaks for itself. It's a rhino with some palm trees around it and some hops and stuff like that. It's very, very, uh, it kind of, it's not uh, open to interpretation. <laughs> but it does make you ask yes, the question that I did. <laughs> yes. I, so like, it also like, it's just the contrast. A lot of just, a lot of our beers you'll see, they have kind of like a general uh, motif of like, you have like the beautiful sky with a gradient and like kind of a foreground, uh, with like a different kind of texture. And you have like contrast in color sometimes. And, Brown chasers, I mean, it's orange and blue. You're gonna hit yeah. like the complementary colors all the time, uh, and so like it's in my opinion, it's one of our more beautiful cans. And uh, yeah, that's I mean, it's pretty much straightforward. Yeah, straightforward and and you stuff. know something I've seen, and maybe our audience will pick up on this, um, especially with the three that we have today. There seems to be an outdoors theme as well. Oh, yeah. um, just the idea of being active outdoors on the water. Um, is that another thing that's a, a real interest of your team? That is absolutely, yes. yeah. A lot of us either surf, hike, camp, do whatever. We're all yeah, about that. We, we all enjoy the outdoors very much. Absolutely. <laughs> it's almost a requirement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it sounds like you guys have some good company parties then that happen out in, you know, beautiful Ashburn, Virginia. <laughs> Yes. So it looks yeah. like there is a question that came in that what are the what are the green berries? Those are, oh, those are, are actually hops. Those are actually hops. Yeah. So those are hops, when hops. um yeah. uh Russ, correct me if I'm wrong, you called them cones, hop cones. They so, kind of grow yeah. on a vine. Yeah. Yes. So they look like berries, but they they um they're kind of uh they dry out and um they're yeah. not quite yeah, they're not a fruit. Um, yeah, but um, that's something else I've noticed on your cans. You kind of always include um, an element of maybe the brew, um, whether it's wheat or hops or um, there's there's a lot of thought into each label. Yeah, you you you. I mean, the the big part of the beer wars is is a lot of people label shop, so you got to put on your label. You know what's what's in the beer. They're going to look at the label, and a lot of people are going to uh, buy a new beer based on a label. Um, unless they're, you know, a hardcore, like, oh, I really like this brewery, so I'll try whatever they'll put out. I mean, even myself, when I'm going and looking, like, I, I, I label shop a lot, and then I look at the bottom of the can. <laughs> <laughs> for the, the bottom of the can for the brewed on date, right? 
for the package date. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So for our, um, for our listeners, it's always good to check for a fresh brew. You don't want something that's been sitting on a shelf for six months, I guess, depending on the style of beer. Yeah, that's Um, true. That's true. (laughs) Many times I've gone to my parents' uh, outdoor fridge when I'm visiting and I'm like, they're like, yeah, let's be in the fridge. And then I go in there, I look at the bottom, I'm like, yeah, this is from last year. <laughs> so, so it's it's not anymore. That needs to go in the trash. Um, yes. 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 That is definitely oxidized. Yeah. Don't cook yeah. it. <laughs> We're learning things all the time. Well, um, while you're enjoying the beers, everybody, I wanted to um, bring in the art. And I was really inspired by... Um, the Lost Rhino Brewing Story. And I'm so glad to know that Matt is a surfer because I didn't read that. Um, but uh, we are, have on screen a very large digital print that's in the uh, permanent collection of the DMFA by an artist named Judith Fox, um, pictured on screen. And um, we actually have three of these prints in the collection, I have to admit. Sorry to disappoint, they are not on view right now. Um, But uh, our next two works are on view. So just go with me on this one. It was too good to pass up. Um, This specific work is called Suspended um, 9627, and it's from a series called The Sea of Dreams. Um, So the series, uh, let me just fast forward to that. So these are the other two works in that series series of three. And I talked about how large these works are. They're almost three feet by four feet. When we're talking about a photograph, we're not talking about something small. It's really big. And I wanted to share that at the front because if these were on view, if you weren't sitting at a computer screen looking at these, you can imagine the effect they would have on you. Um, Walking into something so large and encountering it. Uh, I would like to think that Um, Fox did that intentionally almost to take you to a beach, to an ocean, uh, to feel like you are encountering this scene with her. Um, Now, uh, Judith is actually, um, uh, she lived in Richmond, Virginia with her family, um, met her second husband here, um, but did relocate to Southern California. um, And that is where these photos were taken from a balcony of um, a, a hotel. Uh, right on the beach. So that's how we're getting that almost kind of overlooking feel. It almost feels like a drone photo, but it wasn't. Uh, She did take it. Um, And what she's doing here is she's almost decontextualizing the ocean, something we all know, right? We know what the ocean looks like. We know it has waves, um, that it's sometimes this beautiful blue-green color. Um, There's surf that comes out into the white, but she's abstracting it by taking it at this odd angle um, and kind of taking out the sand, all these things that we would know, the horizon. Um, So she's changing it a bit for us. And she's doing that for a couple of reasons. She really wants to confront the reason why um, humans have this relationship with the ocean. Why do people like Matt um, love to go to the ocean and listen to reggae and wear vans and become a rhino chaser? Um, and, And I thought that was a really nice pairing here of this idea of kind of searching for something. Um, uh, whether it is the perfect wave and and waiting for hours for that and, and that experience and that thrill, um, or is it for some other reason? Um, and so again, here are the other two in the series. Something else that I love about these works, especially considering the large scale that you would see them, um, is how small the people are. It really makes you think a lot about um, how large the ocean is, uh, even when maybe we're just in the shallowest portion of it, um, it can feel, uh, it, it, we need to be reminded sometimes of how big and overwhelming it can be. Um, so just for our listeners, we did pop into the chat um, Judith Fox's artist website. She's also known for a um, series of photographs that she took of her husband who is suffering with Alzheimer's. Um, so there's this really interesting um, portfolio of work where she's looking at the sea and this relationship of, the, of humans with the sea, but also a more personal project that I thought maybe you'd like to look into. Um, so with that, I think we should go on to our next beer, which is my personal favorite, a Hefeweizen. So, um, let's go ahead and open it up. All 
right. So I am seeing kind of um, a soft yellow color. Yes. Okay. Should, should present yellow, not quite orangey, a little opaque, um, which is traditional for, this is a, a traditional German style wheat ale Hefeweizen. Um, and this is actually uh, one of our more complex brews that we that we make. We do have an open fermenter for anybody who may be concerned with who might be knowledgeable in, in fermentation. Most of the time you're fermenting in a closed vessel to keep out potential contaminants and, and things like that. But with your Hefeweizen, you're fermenting at a higher temperature, so it's gonna be more vigorous. So an open fermenter is ideal for that. So you can blow off um, a lot of the undesirable flavors that happen during a, a higher temperature fermentation. So a lot of, uh, most of the brew staff, we have a love-hate relationship with Final Glide um, because of the open fermenter. We love coming in the next day and smelling the banana and the clove and the amazing yeah. aromas that happen and kick off while it's vigorously fermenting. We do not enjoy cleaning that fermenter. <laughs> There's a lot of scrubbing. How would you describe the open? What does it look like? So it looks like uh, anybody has seen Breaking Bad. It looks like one of those vats later in Breaking Bad where they're, where they're making the meth that has a, a top that can open and close. Okay. But this vat can hold up to 3,000 gallons. <laughs> wow. So it's, it's, it's large. It looks like you could make it into a jacuzzi. You, yeah, yeah. You, you could make it into a jacuzzi, but there is no stairs to get there back out. No. I have a feeling that's <laughs> been discussed at a staff meeting. Can we make this into a jacuzzi? Yeah, there have been ideas. There have been ideas. We like yeah, yeah, there's there jello, but many, many things. Yeah. Um, it does make a mess, but it, it's all for the, the benefit of making a very, very high quality product that honestly, no nobody in Virginia is making a, a, a Hefeweizen or wheat ale similar to this. Um, and we, we do filter our beers, but this beer gets very lightly filtered, hence the uh, near opaqueness in mm -hmm. the color. Um, and that's to really maintain a lot of the flavor that's in the beer, because if you filter it too hard, you're gonna strip out a lot of that banana and your clove um, going in there. Yeah. A Heisenberg half of Heisen. That's an so, idea. Yeah, our, our fearless, our fearless housekeeper, Kristen. Um, I love that. A, a breaking bad connection. Um per, maybe there's a maybe there's a future there. Um and I love that you mentioned cloves. I, I was picking up on something, but that feels like such a um holiday smell. Um I got the banana right away. But yeah. cloves, that is um, what I'm getting. So that's, that's great. So do you find yourself, um, are there like typical like uh, tastes that you go for with a Hefeweizen and you kind of jump off from there to, to make your own kind of spin on it? Or um, how do you start that process? Our, our final guide recipe is, is a very traditional recipe. It's actually... Um, we decoct it, which means that we move part of that cereal mash into the boil kettle. And like I said, this is one of the more complex brews that we put out and and very happy to be able to put it into cans so that you know you guys can enjoy it year round. Because at first this was this was a seasonal, like a summer seasonal. It was originally oh. it was not a corporate. Yeah, but now this is year round. Um, uh, which is, you know, it's not easy to do because this yeast does not fit in nations, so we can't reuse this as frequently as like a Yale yeast or a lager yeast. Um, but it's and very much in demand. I don't think I have any metal box right now. So it's it's going to be brewed soon and, and back out. So right now, if you're getting final, probably getting very fresh blend. Nice. So, but like, what, what, to answer your question, like where you're going for it, we're, like it's it's a wheat inspired beer and wheat creates a lot of texture to it. Um, we like to carbonate it uh, a little higher than your scent on that banana flavor and that clove that's going to hit you on the back yeah. end. And honestly, that banana and that clove, that is 100% from the yeast. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, and, you, you know, since you mentioned the wheat, that's what I'm seeing on the label art, that kind of featured um, ingredient or, or natural element. Um, is there anything about the label art that, um, Logan, you'd like to share? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the term quantilite actually is a, uh, let's say, person, the hang glider, I know it's the hang glider is a <laughs> uh, term. Quantilite is basically when you're hang gliding, you're trying to, you know, trying to get to a high elevation when you're flying mm -hmm. off. Uh, final glide is basically, you don't want to be hang gliding when you're, it's like no more sunlight. And so final glide is basically like the last itty bitty uh, rays of sunlight before you know, it becomes evening and dark. So a final glide is literally just the last run of your, uh, of the day for, you know, hang gliding. Um, yeah. The, the wheat that you see on the sides there is actually kind of reminiscent of uh, wings. Huh? You know, it's kind of what the thought process was behind that. Um, and uh, that it's just kind of, you know, as you can see with the colors as well, it's kind of denoting, you know, the last rays of sun, the last rays of the sun, it's kind of like hitting the twilight soon. And uh, also, I don't know if you'll Will notice this, but like you'll see on the very top part there in the top right, three little birds up there. Yeah, it's almost a running joke between me and Matt now, which is he wants them on in some version on every <laughs> can we do. Uh, it started off as a joke, he's like, uh, I've made some lately before, and I'm like, and I send him it, I send him the, the rough drafts, and he's like, you know what, these are missing, right. Like no, what is that? He's like, come on. <laughs> missing the birds. <laughs> I think he did so, it originally to go on my skin, but it just actually became a thing. It is a thing. So they make yeah. sense in this one because it's about flying and flight. Yeah. And I was going to comment on that that you know you said the the wheat is kind of like wings. Well, we have these birds too, but now it's just like an Easter egg. We have to search through every label to find the birds. <laughs> Okay. Oh yeah, at least three. They are not necessarily birds. They will be a three of something. Oh, <laughs> three of something. something. Oh, that makes it better then. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to be looking for our third beer. Um, oh, you can't do. give it away. It's, a, it's yes. a joy to you know make sure Matt's happy. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, I, I just love the colors here because it translates so well to our art, but that kind of like beautiful evening sun. I think um, a description that I read of this beer was about evening magic. Um, yes. The idea that there's this like beautiful um, time during the evening when the light is so um, gold tinted. And I really get that not only from the label, but also the color of the beer. Um, um, so that that's great. The uh, that act, that term EV magic, I think it's in quotes on the description. Um, it's actually another hang gliding term. It's oh, perfect. Exactly what you described. Oh well, there we go. I have to admit, have never hang glided inspired. in my life. So <laughs> <laughs> you're ready. <Yeah. laughs> That's right. Um, well, great. So let's go ahead and turn to the. Um, artwork for this one. Um, so this is a work of art by an American artist named George Ennis, um, done in 1863. This work of art is on view currently in our galleries. There it is. Um, so a pretty large work of art, um, and, and it's been on view for a while. So I hope a lot of our viewers who have been to the museum recently have stumbled upon this work and taken it in because a digital image just doesn't do it justice. Um, but Innes was known as a um, Hudson River School painter, which is an American art movement of landscape painters um, that really focused on something called romanticism, or they were inspired by romanticism, an art movement that um, had an emphasis on um, uh, emotion and individualism, but also they glorified nature, which I just loved that um, description, As especially as I'm sitting talking with you all about um, your connection to nature and being outside and in the outdoors. 
Um, when I look at this piece though, um, and especially some of the details in the work uh, right here, that beautiful golden light is all I was thinking of um, when I was looking at the label art, but also um, reading the description of the beer. Um, it looks like these people could have just been ending kind of a long, hard day and um, looking maybe maybe some sort of um, drink at the end of the day, maybe a Hefeweizen, and maybe something else. Um, but that idea of enjoying a drink after a long, hard day, I could see that um, happening here with this, this beautiful like golden light. Um, Innes was really a master of capturing this light and he did so um, in many, many paintings over a very long painting career. Uh, he ended up moving um, to a um, kind of utopian farm, um, and let me get the exact location, um, at the height of the Civil War um, in 1863. So when this painting was completed, he moved um, to Massachusetts, I'm sorry, to from Massachusetts to New Jersey, to this kind of utopian religious community that really had an effect on his work. And I just wanted to show um, an, a work of art in the VMFA's collection that really showcases that um, change. And this work of art also in the collection um, was done a year before he passed. Um, it's called Sunset. So again, a good connection to our, our final glide, um, Hefeweizen. Um, but here we see Innes's, um kind of loosening up of his treatment of the art. Um, you can see it's not as tightly um, focused on blades of grass, trees. There's still this connection to romanticism, to the emotional connection that can be found in art. Um, but there is this loosening, almost an abstraction, um, and that has been read into this kind of connection to this um, utopian community that he found towards the end of his life and the effect that that had on his religious sensibilities. Um, but, you know, guys, I didn't even give you a chance to reflect on um, Judith Fox. So um, what do you think of Ennis? Um, do, you, do you see kind of the connection between the two? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm saying, like, especially on the motifs of, like, a lot of, like, when you were talking about the lighting, of, like, his use of uh, its color, and it's, like, a bit more on the muted side, but mm -hmm. it's just more denoting, like, these are all farmers, and clearly in a rural setting, and these are all farmers sending their flocks and stuff like that, and this is clearly, at the end of the day, trying to get everything all together, and this is just kind of, it's almost that same feel. And actually, I really do like this. Um, twilight hour. Yeah, that twilight hour. And like the colors are just so warm and muted. And it's very attractive, really. It's, just, it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it was a great pairing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Especially, especially with the colors used, not just in, on the can art, but the colors on the color that the beer presents in as well. Yes. It, it goes very well. It's an excellent oh, yeah. pairing. That's, that's yeah, awesome. absolutely. That's <laughs> yeah. All right, let's keep we brought in our artists, and you forgot <laughs> to talk about the beer. <laughs> um, so that that this is a perfect time to mention that you know you could just get your hefeweizen from the cafe, enjoy it, and then go take in some Innis upstairs. Um, so that's that's exactly what we would hope people would do. Um, well, great. I'm, I'm glad you guys approved of this one. I thought it was, I thought it was a great um, start. So let's go ahead and head to our third beer, um, New River Pale Ale. I'm going to go ahead and open it up. Okay, so this one for me kind of orange is that right it, it seems darker than the first two yes so pour it out and tell us tell us what aromas you're experiencing there is he hmm um man it, it's kind of a sweet maybe like okay. a caramel or yeah yeah and, and then also yeah. but a citrus like um Yes. oranges or something citrusy closer yeah. to grapefruit probably if you if you were able to taste it you would you would, you would <laughs> yeah. get some grapefruit on there you get the smell yes exactly um 
as I said, New River um, is is our is a West Coasty pale ale. Um, there is a story to New River. Um, New River is an old recipe that Old Dominion actually used to brew um, in honor of a home brewer, right? Yeah, he was a home brewer from Blacksburg, um, and he was trying to, his name is Kenny Lefkowitz. Uh, this is like back in 94, oh, yeah. somewhere around there. And Kenny was a, like a talented home brewer, and uh, he had developed this recipe at New River. And uh, for those who don't know, the New River is actually uh, a river that runs through uh, the southwestern part of uh, mm -hmm. Virginia. I don't know my good geography that well. No, <laughs> you're right. Is that true? Logan, here, here, here. it does, because when I was looking... <laughs> Ironically, I do know this. Oh, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, but, uh, I was looking it up, and I was thinking, the New River isn't near them. Why are they doing this? <laughs> I was very confused. <laughs> <laughs> and weirdly enough, the New River is one of the oldest uh, rivers in the United States, if I remember oh. correctly, which is ironic, because it's older. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so it's around that Blacksburg area. Okay. And uh, he developed this recipe. Uh, he tried to get a brew started by himself to produce New River. Specific, that would be his flagship, flagship starting beer. Uh, he couldn't quite get the Jerry Bailey, who owned Old Dominion, the previous brewery that was here in Lyman County. Uh, they were able to, he was able to make a deal with Jerry that they would brew New River, and it did very well at Old Dominion. It even won several awards, uh, JBF, which is one of the biggest uh, beer festivals of uh, the United States. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so Old Dominion brewed it. Uh, unfortunately, Kenny uh, had passed away uh, in 2004, uh, and so Old Dominion kept brewing it. And then once Old Dominion left, they kind of dropped the brand. But Kenny, uh, Kenny's family still owned the rights to the recipe. Oh. So uh, when Matt started Lost Rhino, he bought the rights from Kenny's parents. And so technically, New River is our oldest brand. Yeah, got it. Was, it was like our 25th anniversary of New River. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was years ago. Uh, yeah, 2019. 2019. We celebrated the 25th anniversary of, of brewery beer. New River in, in Loudoun County. Yeah. So this beer has been brewed for 25 years <laughs> in Loudoun County. It is um, a legacy brew. Yeah. Okay. And it's actually, it's, it's a staple. It's a taproom favorite. It's a brewer's favorite. Uh, most, most of us, we really enjoy when a fresh batch comes through. Um, so to speak to the, the brew, um, this is one of the, the beers that leverages our hop back. So there are whole cone beef hops that go into there. So those are your fresher hops that aren't as processed. So you're going to get a lot more flavor, a lot more residual dust that's still on the cones as well. But you get a lot of those lupins that are still housed within the cones that mm -hmm. can sometimes be lost in the processing process uh, when they pelletize the hops, which is more commonly used in uh, commercial brewing and, and home brewing these days as well. Um, the, the sweetness and the caramelization, you hit it spot on. This is one of our 90 minute bills. So it does get um, a lot more caramelization from our, our steam fuel house. Uh, so on the edges of that boiler, you're, you're gonna really cook that beer and reduce it down from, uh, from from the starting volume uh, down, it's, it's, it is a reduction when you're when you're brewing a lot of these beers, um, and the hops are very West Coasty, um, mixed with um, some some flavor and some zazz. You know, COVID's presented some challenges for everybody, uh, mm -hmm. so there are a few new rivers that may have had some hop substitutions, but oh. um, you know, it's it's part of the brewing process as well um, to be able to ebb and flow with what you're able to acquire, but still, you know, really hit the nail on the head with the essence of the beer, which this is, you know, not an overly hop, overly bitter beer, but you're still going to get like that grapefruity, pugnant thing. Um, commercially, I, it would be best compared to like a Sierra Nevada pale ale okay. or a Sierra Nevada, even like a torpedo extra pale ale, because we do dry hop this pale ale. Um, so it, it really gives you a lot more of that grapefruity, citrusy, 
um, aroma and flavor when you're drinking it down mixed with that sweet, dark caramel. Um, very enjoyable. Another great outdoor uh, by the river, uh, floating down on an inner tube uh, kind of beer. Yeah. Well, and I love I love this story that it it you know predates Lost Rhino, but it it belongs there. You know, if Old Dominion had taken it, correct me if I'm wrong. I think Old Dominion went to Delaware, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Is that so? Yeah, it would be even odder for them to have a new river beer. Um, it, it's its home is in Virginia, so and, and it kind of just harkens back to this. I again loving your origin story. This idea of the lost rhino. The new river is not near you guys, but um, there is definitely kind of an emotional tie to that. So that's great. Um, so was Matt friends with um, this home brewer that you mentioned? He knew him. Uh, so Matt, I know, I, I think I'd asked that a couple times. He had, he had known Kenny, but not like in a very, like more like they would see, Kenny would actually come by and brew New River in a professional sense they knew each other, but Old Dominion was a very large brewery where mm -hmm. you would have people drink in the morning and at night, people seeing each other, like as they're leaving to go home or as they're starting their shifts. Right. Um, but he had met Kenny on several occasions. But he had always known the he had always known the New River. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he, he I mean he knew that uh with you. So Yeah. Uh yeah, he didn't know him. He knew him in a professional. Right. Yeah, definitely in passing or in the community for sure, it sounds like. Um, but either way, it sounds like it has its home here. Um, so um, a good question just came in, um, and, we, and we haven't Absolutely. talked about it yet, besides um, how we're hoping a lot of our guests got your beers tonight um, with VMFA to go. But where can we find Lost Rhino Brewing in stores? Yes, so we um, we have distribution in Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. right now. And okay. I'm assuming this is mostly Rich, a Richmond, Richmond audience. Uh, Richmond audience. You know, it 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 could it could range. I'm seeing a lot of <laughs> Richmonder names. I, I recognize a lot of our audience members, but yes, okay. Richmond is a good strong showing. So as far as I know, you can find us in uh, Wegmans, Kroger's, and your. I think we're in Food Lion as well. If there's any. Uh, there, yeah. Oh no, this food line. Don't worry. <laughs> Sorry. Logan is familiar with Richmond. From Richmond so. Okay. <laughs> um, and I assume like things like Total Wine, that sort of thing. Yes. 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 yes absolutely. Total okay. Wine. And you'll find the flagship product. So um, tonight we've sampled three of our flagship products, and um, those you'll be able to find. So Alexandria and Mount Vernon, yes, so yes, same thing. Absolutely. Um, okay. Grocery stores, Wegmans, if Harris Teeter. Yeah, yeah like you'll Peter. find us. Yeah. Giants. In, yeah. in Northern Virginia, we're pretty very covered um, in your in your Harris Teeters, Wegmans, mm -hmm. Food Lions. And, def and total, of course. Total line, yeah. yeah. And I have to admit, next time I'm label shopping, I mean, I feel like yours will really kind of jump off. Those contrasting colors, um, the brightness, I, I think they'll kind of jump off the shelf. So um, definitely yeah. something and to keep And there's a lot of um, an integrity to the brand. So I'm sure a lot of folks who have shopped for beer recognize that kind of the trend was a solid metal can wrapped in a simple design. Mm -hmm. Well, that's... Um, that simplicity wasn't going to work for our brand. So Logan toils for many hours to create every label that, that you find on our brew. Nice. Well, oh, great work. <laughs> and, and if I can plug real quick our, our cause I love this thing. I love this. Yes. Oh. Please. Um, this is, this is Dawn Patrol. Uh, this is what we can today. Um, okay. You know, very artistic. This is like one of my favorite labels that we have here. Um, this is a session India Pale Ale, so lower ABV, uh, only like 4.2% 4, 4 alcohol, so you can have a few of them without getting sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> but very pronounced top flavor that you would recognize in an India Pale Ale. 
Um, and just like I was, we were canning this today for several hours and I just couldn't help but just sit back and just enjoy the many colors and, 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 and just the like mosaic -y kind of um, tainted uh, stained glass yes. style. Yes. Yeah, you went for that. I, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, there's, so I think there's a part two. Too. Yeah, I think there's a part two here with Lost Rhino because stained Absolutely. glass, we have tons of that. We can definitely make a connection. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go ahead and take a look at our final work of art. Um, it went a little more literal with, with this connection because of the idea of what we've been talking about, these tasting notes. Um, this kind of um, fruitiness that can come out in the beer. Um, and I, there are obviously a lot, lots of still lives in the VMFA collection, but I found this one the most interesting because I'm sure it would um, kind of drive people's brains crazy who understand growing seasons and when things are available because this um, still life could not be possible. Um, Jan van Os was an 18th century Dutch artist um, and he was a master of um, capturing light on objects. And I think we can see that here and um, um, respect that talent. Um, I'm thinking, looking specifically at the grapes. Um, they're like each individual globe is perfectly created. But then looking, I just keep going, looking at the carnations, um, which of course I didn't have a detail of, but the carnations here. Um, it almost looks like we could touch them. They're so realistic. Um, and then, of course, the striped ones at top. But what Jan van Os would do, and, and this isn't unusual, but um, he was a master of it, so he often um, is touted for doing this. Um, he would make individual studies of each aspect of the still life. Um, so when a pineapple is in season and it's beautiful and lush and green at top and these beautiful coppery red tones at bottom, um, that's when he would capture that in his workshop and he would you know, paint it then. Um, and then he would move on to the next thing, whether it's a melon or grapes or plums. Um, and then he would take all of these studies and bring them together. Um, sorry, we'll go back here. We'll bring them together to create this master still life. So it's almost like, you know, 18th century Photoshop right? Um, he's taking each picture and then bringing it into this one image that he has in his mind. Um, and I, I just think that's fascinating, especially Russ, as you mentioned, COVID presented its challenges and you had to do some substitutions and tinkering with um, your recipe. Uh, just this idea that um, you know, you, you work with what you have and you get creative and um, you make the best of it. Um, also, now knowing the story behind New River, that it was this um, very historic home brewers uh, recipe, um, you know, there's this there's this creativity and um, uh, homage to brewing, it sounds like, um, whether you're using the recipe to its truest form or kind of getting creative and putting a spin on it. Um, I can see that here in these still lives as well. Um, so um, you guys, tell me your thoughts about Jan van Os here. Um, we kind of went a little different. We went from modern to American, and now we're looking at our oldest work um, with uh, the 18th century Dutch still life. Oh, did we lose you guys? Oh no, there you are. I think you hit it with the with the. Uh oh. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> there you are. I said I, yeah. you hit it very well with the way that he plays with the lighting. You can see it on the grapes. Ah, uh, Ben. Uh, what's that? Yeah, and and just again that description. <laughs> on the very bottom. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that description, you know, is the refreshing zest of nature through lemony, piney aromas with a touch of sweet tropical fruit. And, you know, oftentimes in American art collections, you're not going to see a pineapple. <laughs> so I had to bypass right. the yeah. rosin. <laughs> I, I had to bypass the rosin for those of you on our call who are VMFA um, uh, longtime devotees. Um, but the, the Van Os here, I think, really fit the bill for the beer that we're looking at. Um, okay, so um, next, uh, we, I just wanted to 
um, let me see here. Oh, there we go. Um, again, just wanted to share here the three works that we looked at. We really covered a gamut, and it sounded like we covered a gamut um, from uh, your your uh, brew house as well. Um, we looked at a modern work of art, a large digital print that I think really illustrated your um, origin story and, and Matt's personality for sure, which worked out well. Um, and then we went to an American work of art and capturing that evening magic. And, and we ended here with a Dutch still life, um, really honing in on some of the flavor profiles of your beers. Um, is there anything else that you all would like to share? Um, we have um, just a we have some time left in our our program. Anything that we didn't touch on? I just, to us, I mean, our art is very important to us and our brand. Um, it's a key part of everything we do. So, um, but yet we had never done this before. So I was really excited to to bring these guys in and and share this with you and the audience. And I just. I want to thank you for the opportunity and, um, and thank you for, for including. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, it, it it was a it's a natural fit. I mean, there's so much art that goes into the beer making process, not only brewing the beers, but um, kind of identifying a brand and what the look is. Um, like I said, Logan, I'm going to be looking for those three of everything. And I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to this one now, because I want to know what it is. Um, hold on. I think you'll find it's very similar to the first. Oh, it's two. the birds. Okay, <laughs> yes. okay, there they are. We just can't see them all in this picture. And um, the, that's uh, as you, you can probably see the uh, the moon, that crescent moon and stars. That's so. This was not the original New River table. I had, we had updated the design, and uh, that crescent moon and stars are left over from the original. From the uh, there was a leftover element from the original, like. So it's kind of like an oh. homage to the, the you know, New River of yesteryear. <laughs> nice, nice. There's like history within the label too. This yeah. this year, it packs a lot into it. It does. It really yeah. does. We can right. talk all day about New yeah. River. <laughs> we, we, we love our history here. I, it, you know, by all, once, you know, everything gets back to normal and we start doing tours again, anybody who has the pleasure of visiting us in Ashburn, and going on one of our safari tours. Um, right. We talk a lot about the history and how proud we are that we have all this old <laughs> equipment. <Yes. laughs> it can sometimes be tedious to work on. Uh, before we had the meeting, we were sitting here and Stephanie's like, what's that cackling? <laughs> we're like, that's the boiler. <laughs> that boiler is old. old. That boiler is older than I am. Yes. <laughs> so so you have some equipment with some personality. Oh, exactly. <laughs> we, we, we lovingly name everything here in the brewery. Right behind us, our canning line is lovingly named Maria. So, <laughs> whenever she's acting up. Whatever Maria. she's doing. Maria. <laughs> <laughs> and again, that's that integrity piece. I mean, we're, we're very um, old school, traditional. We, we want to keep beer the, the way that Matt learned and, yeah. and founded this, that we're, yeah. we want to stay true to that. Very, very respectful to the, both the culinary side of it, the artistic side of it, and the science side of it. We do have an in-house lab. We monitor a lot of aspects of our beer. So, you know, we are, we have the right of saying we are the oldest brewery in Loudoun County, but there have been a lot that have popped up around but you know they're still figuring it out we we know what we're doing <laughs> we take pride in it um it's one of the reasons that i i i love working here and will continue to work here is because i'm very proud of the product that we put out you know, we work very hard on it and it's it's so that y'all can enjoy very good high quality beer in northern virginia and hopefully soon in in more of the southeastern and, and northeastern united states 
Yeah, definitely sounds like a brewery to keep an eye out for. Um, and I feel fortunate that we can get it so easily in Richmond. Um, just to quickly address Audrey's question. Audrey, yes, you are very correct. Right down here, we can see a pomegranate um, and those kind of juicy red seeds spilling out of it. Again, just this attention to light and detail that Menos was a real master of. Um, okay, well, uh, with five minutes left, if there are any other questions or comments from the audience, please send them in. We would love to hear from you. Um, but uh, if you are looking for something to do after this, we do have our virtual summer breeze, um, also a part of our um, uh, Fridays After Five presented by Chase series. Uh, so that link was just dropped in the chat for you. It takes you right to a YouTube page. You can finish your beers and listen to some music by um, Miss Her. And then please join us for our next Taste of Art program with Rich Wine RVA. Yes, we don't just do beer, we do wine. Uh, so please register for that event. It's not up quite yet, but I did have my coworker Kristen drop that link into the chat because we do have other virtual gallery programs going on. So if anything is of interest, that link will take you there. And you can just bookmark that so you can come back on July 9th for our next event. Uh, Logan, Stephanie, Russ, thank you so much. This was great. Um, and, you know, I am going to put my name in the hat to do it again, hopefully a part two with Lost Rhino talking about some other beers, um, but also maybe just making a trip in person um, this fall. That sounds like the perfect time to come. Absolutely. To yes. to we encourage anybody who can uh, make the trip here. We, we, we do have tasting room exclusives. We do have art in the tasting room. We do. <laughs> yeah. And we have a, a little pinball arcade as well. Yeah. <laughs> Something for everybody. My four-year-old will be pleased. My husband will be pleased. It'll be great. Yeah. So let's count on it. Well, thank you all so Wonderful. much. And um, thank you to our attendees for, again, joining us for um, VMFA Fridays After Five presented by Chase Taste of Art with Lost Rhino Brewing Company. I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. 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 Cheers.